the, the, but man, so there's lots to talk about there, I think, philosophically and, uh, uh, and otherwise. Uh, now, uh, definitely not to uh, be outdone is our, uh, our next contestant this morning, and he's uh, none other than my longtime friend, uh, Marv Slepian. Uh, Marv is a legendary character in, uh, uh, in uh, both... Uh, uh, in device development and certainly in cardiology, he has one of these great provenances from from uh, uh, Princeton to uh, Cleveland Clinic, and that, then to when he was at the U, when he was at the U of A, he uh, with Jack Copeland developed the first total artificial heart and brought that company uh, uh, Syncardia uh, to uh, public work. He's also uh, largely responsible for uh, uh, vascular paving. It's too much to talk about with this character. I'll let him do the talking because now he's going to talk about another passionate area uh, of his and some of ours right now, and that is uh, medical tattoos or transient electronics or epidermal electronics. Sorry about that. Uh, maybe also cochlear implants after you're finished with me. Right. Uh, come into a tattoo near you. Help me welcome my friend, Marv Slepian. Thank you very much. It's a, really an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's my first time at this conference, and I think it's fantastic. I, I'm learning a lot. I want to thank David and the other organizers for the invitation. Uh, just to kind of give a frame, you know, I spent a lot of time in clinical medicine. I'm a clinical uh, both internist and cardiologist, but I've been a lab geek my whole life and uh, have really been working in the lab since I was 12. So I have an active lab, and we do a lot of work on biomaterials and on sort of implications and interactions with cells, etc. So I'm going to give you kind of a broad perspective on a lot of things. If this goes forward, can I get this to advance? My slides aren't advancing. So there you go, technology and its limitations. I have some disclosures. Keep going. All right. I want to frame this first. I'm going to go back from 40,000 feet yesterday to 80,000 feet. So I, I want to say that basically from a perspective of innovation, things are moving quickly, okay? And if you take a look on the left, <clears throat> that's the classic perspective of the physician. <clears throat> and uh, we used to spend a lot of time with patients, and now this is on rounds today, and you can see basically we have all the information at our fingertips, but the bad news is where is the patient? No one is really interacting in a great way with the patient. So we're losing a little bit of, about uh, the great uh, ability to interact, uh, and I, I'm a little bit worried about that. Diagnostics are getting better, uh, quicker. We're doing more point-of-care type diagnostics. Certainly the big interventions that we can do today. We heard yesterday about the big debate between open and endo. Uh, so medicine relies a lot about on innovation to kind of move forward. It's a great opportunity, but we have to be a little careful and we have to use it wisely. And what I want to posit for you here this morning is that to drive innovation to kind of help us, particularly in this space and broadly in medicine as well as in, certainly in your domain, is that there are opportunities to advance uh, device design based on advances in materials. And I'm a material scientist. So basically, before I get into that, I want to give you some of the pressures that we face uh, in medicine. We all know there are financial outcomes, population, and disease-based uh, uh, pressures in front of us. And we're moving from this sort of one-size-fits-all to a more personalized type medicine. And I'm, I'm, I'm positing that our technology and this type of approach could help you in that space. And we have other burdens in front of us. Number one, we're living longer. So we have more people that are going to live uh, uh, beyond 65 into a uh, later age. As David has said many times, we're now dealing with more chronic disease than with infectious disease. And in fact, if you look at the number of people that are going to be 100 years old over the next uh, two decades, uh, about 17% of all seniors will be that old. Uh, and then we have population growth, which is moving in a dramatic way. And whether you believe in all of these numbers, the fact of the matter is really the important point is on the bottom of the slide. The improvements in diagnosis and therapy are not keeping up with the number of patients that we're going to have to take care of. And in our broad space, broadly, uh, in cardiovascular disease, it certainly still remains the leading cause of death. Uh, and we're making improvements. We've certainly reduced the risk of cardiovascular death in men, but in women, it's actually on the rise. And then we're doing it to ourselves. Certainly the obesity epidemic that we heard about yesterday, which is driving diabetes, which is germane to, to this meeting here today. And in fact, what we know in cardiovascular medicine today is that if you have diabetes alone, this is only really put out in the last decade, 
that the risk of cardiovascular of a diabetes is exactly the same as having the risk of cardiovascular disease. And if you have the two together, you have an exponential increase in risk. So the trends that are upon us that we want to deal with are the fact that we want to become a little bit more individualized as far as care. We want to reduce cost. We're certainly under the metric of outcomes and effectiveness. Uh, we're going to be responsible for what we're doing. We just can't be doing procedures willy-nilly. We certainly have this issue of healthcare disparities. I was taken aback by the uh, data shown yesterday, uh, uh, racial data about the amputation differences that were talked about. And we're certainly interested, could we use some of this electronics and technology to help patients? And the idea is that we also are becoming more savvy individually about our own self, so that as we all age, we're interested in sort of getting data with a, uh, the concept of the informed well, moving all the way up to chronic uh, disease. And these diagnostics are not just in the hospital. The shift is from, to be out of the hospital. So we need information, the ability to diagnose things in a remote setting uh, uh, on an individual basis uh, as well. And that's where this technology comes in. So the location of the new diagnostics really have to be both on self and potentially even in self. I added a couple things here. I'll try to keep on time here for you. But I wanted to bring up both the idea of not only epidermal but internal electronics as well. So that brings up the issue of materials. You've got to build things. We, for the, I do a lot of work with the FDA. You certainly have to use FDA-approved materials. We have conventional metals and plastics and rubbers and batteries, etc. But there's a, an issue in terms of material matching. It, depending upon where you go, where you put your device, you really have to match it. If it's internal or external, if it's inside on an organ, there are pr property issues. And one of the big issues that exists today is a materials mismatch issue, an issue of compliance. We're using a lot of rigid devices uh, today conventionally, and they really don't match what we're trying to, to uh, oppose to, which brings up an opportunity. And the opportunity is not only can we improve the modulus or the material properties, but we also could make materials smart. And that's what I'm here to talk about uh, in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, which is the idea of these composite polymer and electronic materials. So we'll cover stretchable electronics, which is a new field that we're uh, seminal in, biodegradable and transient electronics, which is really uh, a basic thing that we've uh, developed, and then piezoelectric materials as well, and even paper. So the material requirements are we certainly would like to match the uh, properties of individual uh, biomechanics, load handling, biocompatibility, hemocompatibility, has, has to have the right tox, can't be inflammatory, and ultimately we'd like to make these materials have some smarts and be uh, uh, responsive, which brings up stretchable electronic biomaterials. We know that electronics are all around us. They have dynamic responsiveness. They can sense, actuate, give feedback, data storage, provide power, telemetry, I was, uh, really enjoyed uh, the prior talk, although it was more mechanical, but still, if you add electronics, it could be very good. Now, in the electronics world, and again, this is a very interdisciplinary domain that I work in, but in the electronics world, we all know about Moore's Law, making things quicker, faster, and smaller, but we're getting to the end of Moore's Law. We can't make chips that are any uh, thinner than where we are. We have to go to quantum electronics. So the big push in electronics has changed the form factor. That's another area for development. And the idea is to make things both flexible, then stretchable, then transient, and even biodegradable. Now, the, the issue here is this is where a mismatch occurs. Electronics are basically made of metal or silica as conductors. They're rigid. And the domains that we want to apply them to, like the body, are elastomeric, hence the mismatch. So, and, and this is an example, when I click past, I won't go back, is, you know, wearing these types of sensors. I'm, I'm wearing one myself, and this is a big, bulky type thing. Wouldn't it be nice if I could have something which is really thin, innocuous, and conformal? And this is what we're talking about. Polymers mixed with additive electronics. And the way we do this is we, I'll walk you through it. This involves really chip technology. So we work with um, silicon-based uh, materials. Uh, we, this is typical chip type fab work, which is done in these large uh, fabs. Um, and we make these chips, then we thin them, and then we actually apply them to a stamp, and then we transfer print these materials on whatever the substrate we want. So if we want it to be an implant or an external device, we'll uh, print this on there. And then what we do is we create interconnects. But the novelty here is that we create interconnects that are redundant, which allow us to create this type of stretchability. And we use a preformed substrate so that it's, it's preformed in a stretched configuration. So when we release it, we get these kind of pop-ups of these interconnects, which allow us to have uh, stretchability. 
there's more physics novelty here. The, the novelty is the fact that the critical element, the CMOS chip or whatever the electronic semiconductor is, it's in a neutral mechanical plane. So even though we're twisting it, nothing really happens to that electronic. And at the same time, we've created these redundant type uh, um, um, interconnects which allow us to have stretch and extended strain without damaging the island where the electronic is. And here's an example. You can see this under SEM that we can get significant stretching uh, of these types of materials. We can now wrap a sphere, not just wrapping a cylinder. We can be completely conformal. And these little islands can be, you know, the electronics world. Electrodes, photodiodes, complete uh, little uh, uh, radios, thermocouples, LEDs, etc. Whatever we need, photovoltaics. So effectively, we built, and this is a team, we built um, uh, smart paper, smart gloves, fabric, leather, and then appliques to the skin. So uh, as far as smart skins, we want them to be ultra-thin, breathable, conformal, stretchable, and we can have a lot of sensors. We've, to date, put on EKG, heart rate monitoring, pressure and flow. We're working on a tissue stiffness. I'm going to show you some data right at the end. Hydration status and edema, motion, and analytes as well. This is a patch. We also are working with DARPA. This is a device that we built for DARPA for the warfighter, which basically can measure their clinical status out in the field, uh, and it's, uh, it could integrate even with systems like we just saw. This is a, a complete, here's your tattoo that you asked for. So this is your skin tattoo. This is a complete active uh, little radio system that has capacitors, uh, resistors, a little power capability, and uh, it's conformal to the skin. This was actually written up in the Times. And we've commercialized some of this in full disclosure. We have a company, MC10, and we've actually built something for the sports world. This is a, uh, a head impact indicator that is now marketed by Reebok. Uh, and this is a device, uh, and it goes around the head. Uh, and we're right in the middle of this chronic encephalopathy that, uh, that football players get. Well, here's the tattoo near you. This is from a, a paper of ours that was in science where we basically built a tattoo that has completely integrated in uh, electronics in terms of uh, inducers, capacitors, inductors, oscillators, etc. It could measure uh, various parameters as well, and it potentially could go away. It, as, as you can see, it has a lot of stealth capabilities, so the military is pretty interested in this kind of technology. Uh, the idea of a wearable skin, IEEE is pretty interested in this type of thing. I threw this in because of yesterday's talk. We're doing a lot of work, you know, interventionally as well. So we built some smart balloons. Could we measure things on the inside as well in terms of pressure and flow? So here's the rationale for this. This is from my world, AFib. Although I'm more of a plumbing guy, not so much an arrhythmia guy, uh, but basically AFib is a big problem. All the AHA, ACC will tell you that when drugs fail, you need an ablation. So make believe this is a toe, even though it's an atria. But the point is that this is an irregular shape or this is something after you've done your debridement and you've got this chronic ulcerated situation. If you want to go in there and measure anything, oxygen, conductance, healing, pH, uh, whatever is going on in there, uh, it's difficult to, to do this with conventional stiff electronics. Here's the issue. Here's a mismatch in terms of size. This is an EP electrode, three millimeters. There's your cell. You've got a 20-fold mismatch and you're trying to really tell what's going on there. It doesn't make sense. So what we've done is we built this smart balloon, which has, it's, it's one or two orders of magnitude lower as far as the electronics. These can be simple nodes, but these can be multiplex nodes, which actually can process data even on the balloon. And um, so we published this. This was a combined effort between Illinois and Arizona, and uh, uh, this was published in Nature Materials. But it shows you that you could stretch uh, things without uh, the sensors popping off. Uh, that you could measure uh, a tension, a, a microtactile sensing. It's important in EP because if you uh, press too hard, you'll burn through and create a fistula. Or uh, imagine you're doing an angioplasty. You don't want to uh, overinflate or cause some damage. Uh, we also can sense temperature because we're blading. And again, if you apply too much heat, you can create a, a disaster in there. So the, the converse is we could use this for sensing in a wound. You could use this for broadly seeing what's going on uh, in a location. We can measure flow via multiple means. This is a resistive means. We can actuate. We have little LEDs. We can deliver drugs. We can activate polymers. This was an actual case where we ablated. We turned it off based on the sensing shown on the bottom right. Uh, so we used this in an integrated, smart, closed-loop kind of fashion. Dr. Najafi, closed-loop. So um, the other ability we have here is uh, to really get more granular. This is an uh, electronic web that we built that we could apply over a broad tissue. In this case, we applied, applied it over the heart. 
and uh, we can measure signals from all around. So if this will play, uh, it's probably not playing. Well, uh, maybe you can click on it. The, the point of this slide is to show you on the bottom what the normal EKG looks like. If this would have played, what you would see is this wave of depolarization, which is almost fractalized, that you're getting information, which we don't even know what the EKG looks like from this perspective. So enter big data. Now all of a sudden we're, we're ga gathering sort of local, regional, cellular information that we otherwise could never get before. And we've applied this type of stretch of electronics to an example. David mentioned the artificial heart. This is the artificial heart. But it's pretty much a passive system. It just works by a fluid in and fluid out Starling's law. There's no activity in this in terms of feedback. So we've been building sensors that now go on our stretchable membrane to give us sensing of filling, of thrombosis, etc. that could go on in the artificial heart. Um, I, w I wanted to bring up the idea of smart stents. So, and smart paving layers. We heard yesterday from Dr. Conti about the issues of restenosis and stents, uh, which occur broadly. So, you know, we did angioplasty, uh, vessels collapse, so we put in a stent to attempt to mechanically keep that up, but cells are smarter than metal, so they crawl around it, so basically you get instant restenosis, so then we, which is a horrible disease, which you see here. Uh, and this is the cascade of all that, very complicated. And then we added a drug which knocks out smooth muscle cells, but unfortunately it also knocks out endothelial cells, and lo and behold, boom, you have thrombosis, and now you're worse off before having a small lesion and a little bit of angina or a little bit of claudication. In this case, you have an infarct, and now you're a cardiac cripple. So the idea is, could we build a stent that actually had some smarts on it that would improve outcome, that would allow us for both non-invasive monitoring and, and would allow the stent to be somewhat adaptable. We would measure pressure and flow, and the big goal was could we measure mass buildup, fouling of the stent. Um, and uh, this is from a, a patent of ours almost 10 years ago, where we started this with an implant and a sensor and an actuator, nested loop technology that could even communicate to the web, and the idea of having a sort of a motherboard that would be on a stent which would have all the different elements in terms of sensing and power, storage, telemetry as well, uh, and all of the different modules that might fit on kind of a smart stent. Well, we're, the world has moved a little bit beyond conventional metal, and many years ago I, I worked on a technique called end a little paving, sort of my real claim to fame of our, the original biodegradable stent strategy back in the 80s and 90s, and the, this is the idea of putting a polymer inside of a blood vessel to act as a support. So the idea is, could we now take this technology and then add electronics to it? And the idea of paving was to overcome limitations of stents, adding other functionality like barriers and drug delivery means. This became commercialized under Focal as a company, not as a stent, but as a polymer material used as a sealant, because we were too early. The first stent was approved in 94, and we were a little bit before that. And here is the biodegradable stent that's about to come out 25 years later by Abbott. It's the BVS. So... We've been working on electronics that could marry with this. And this is a paper of ours that we had the uh, privilege of having it published on the uh, cover of Science, and the idea of uh, creating completely biodegradable electronics. We made the electronics out of ultra-thin magnesium and silicon. And silica, if you make it ultra-thin, becomes silicilic acid. It will hydrate. It will dissolve. So this is a complete circuit. It, it, this is how we make it. It's made of different layers. It's printed. And this shows you, over time, how this will uh, degrade and that over time you'll see the height of the chip goes away, you see the traces go away, and you see that we have a change in conductivity over time as this starts to bioabsorb. We built an actual device that could measure infection inside of a, a small animal model. We put this in, we could sense temperature change, and effectively we also built an electroceutical which could effectively treat by virtue of heat, uh, and it was innocuous, it went away without significant inflammation. If this comes forward, there's a little movie. I still have two and a half minutes. So can I get to the next slide? We'll run this pretty quick, but I want to show you what one of these constructs looks like. So this is a thin film uh, biodegradable electronic construct. It's a complete circuit. We applied it to water. You see it goes in. It will immediately try to hydrate based on sort of surface tension. This was something built to biodegrade very quickly. We can change the, the time. If you want something which lasts a day, a week, a month, we can do it. So just use your imagination. In surgery, maybe we want to monitor. We put in post-procedure to see if something's bleeding, to see if there's an infection, whatever. Here you see it starts to hydrate at 25 seconds. It's already pretty much uh, thinned. And uh, if, if this were to go forward even more, I'm going to cut this off just because of time. I want to show you a couple more things. It will completely go away, and by two hours, the thing is gone. So this is a completely biodegradable thing. 
So imagine we take our paving and we add this technology to it. And one of my graduate students, this is her PhD thesis, she's working on this right now, of basically building a complete smart biodegradable stent. And uh, another aspect, piezoelectrics. So this is a, well, something we're working on. So we need energy for these things. So this piezo concept is materials that can capture energy. So we've been working on piezoelectric materials. We published this this year in PNAS. We developed the piezoelectric polymer. We put it on the heart, and we were able to completely recharge a pacemaker by the motion of the heart and the motion of the lung. And this shows you the ability, based on intensity of contraction, to generate more electricity. Paper also is valuable, and it could even be more valuable on the external side. There's a lot of work with paper microfluidics. And this is just an example of a diagnostic device that could be built out of paper cheaply. This is something that was actually funded by the Gates Foundation for world diagnostics around the world. The la I'm going to skip through microfluidics only because of time, but I want to show you one or two things. I, we actually talked about this at, last night a little bit, but the idea is we have all these devices that you put in the bloodstream. And um, it's very tough to measure the amount of shear and the thrombotic potential of these devices. We have a way to mathematically create a quotient of the degree of shear that could be platelet activating. And we, we, this is shown in the upper right. It's this curve. We call it a PDF. So the point of this uh, little piece of the presentation is the fact that from these PDFs, which are signature of thrombosis, we are be able to uh, reverse engineer this PDF in terms of the shear load into a microfluidic chip. So I can, in a customized fashion, tell you how much shear you have based on your degree of arterial stenosis or your degree of stent implant or, or aneurysm. I need another two minutes, David. And um, we basically can measure, uh, so we built a toolkit, an engineering toolkit of microfluidic little elements that we could put together to recapitulate shear stress. And effectively, you can see on the bottom, this looks very much like those curves I showed you a moment ago. This is your personalized uh, stress load. So imagine you've got a device that you have, at, you prick your finger, you get a drop of blood, it goes through this, and you know whether or not you're protected in terms of the various antithrombotic or anticoagulant drugs you're taking. I threw this in just because I'm pretty excited. This is a project that one of my graduate students is working on, and the paper was just accepted yesterday in Nature Materials. So I put in the figures. This isn't even published yet, but this is the idea of using piezoelectrics to measure tissue properties. So this really fits with the diabetic foot ulcer situation. Here you've got a wound. We're not sure what's going on. You look at the surface, but you're really not sure what's going on inside. We're using piezoelectrics to not only stimulate, but sense. And based on the underlying material properties, we're going to get a very different signal back. So this just shows you in the top figures, these are a range of different materials, and we get different slopes. So we can characterize the modulus of the material based on this electronic type sensing. Here, we applied this to normal volunteers, to women and men looking at different regions of skin across the body, and we can see very big differences in terms of material properties. We've also taken lesions, and we're able to then put this over a lesion. So imagine this is a foot ulcer, and we can now actually calculate local material property issues where there may be subterranean pus or other things that you can't even see using this type of sensing technology. We actually applied this to various dermatologic diseases, and we've been able to diagnose a malignancy before you can see it using this technology, which was then biopsy confirmed. So I think this has a lot of applicability in your particular domain. So I, I'm going to conclude here, but say that, you know, with all the electronics and capabilities we've got, I see this sort of integrated suite that may emerge that we can have external sensors, internal sensors, and whether you have a smart implant. If you're a cardiac patient, you may have a VAD. If you're a peripheral vascular patient, you may have an aneurysmal implant. But th that could be a nidus for having a sensor which can then integrate and talk outside to the world. So let me conclude. I think I've gone through this a little quickly, but I think I wanted to give you a big picture, that medicine is under multiple pressures. We have aging. We have cost. We have chronic disease. And we're entering a world of sort of the digitized self. I mean, everyone's got a smartphone. Next, you're going to have the Apple Watch. So basically, could we not use this to improve care, but in a more integrated way, not just in a consumer kind of way? And we need innovation to improve our technologies, and this is where materials come in. So we're going to stay in the space of working on novel materials that are valuable for both on-self and in-self platforms. We now have a class of materials that are stretchable, flexible, transient, and piezoelectric materials that are biocompatible as well. And I think there, there are a lot of opportunities to translate these materials into practical devices in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.
Yeah. Oh, all right. God dang. That was great. Uh, so uh, I'm 